Welcome, everyone. This is Freddie Baez from TCG Collective. I think we're waiting another second or so. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Linda. Yeah, we'll, we'll be waiting a few more minutes. Copy that. Ignore my reflection, but that's part of the G coming in as part of that event. All right, shall we get started? That would be great. Awesome. So welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us on today's Shinjiro session. I want to go ahead and introduce Shane Carlin. Um, Shane will be talking about his experience as an adoptee, um, as well as becoming an entrepreneur who helps Asian Americans move through the pipeline to leadership. Um, so Shane, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Linda, and I want to thank you and Nancy and 42nd Parallel for this partnership with us at Asian Student Achievement, LLC, and we really appreciate everyone coming out for this event. Uh, I would say it was probably a, a, a tough to go out, but we don't have to, even though there was like six to seven inches of snow when all we really had to do was just be warm in our homes and pull out the computer. So it's kind of, I guess that's the silver lining of dealing with a pandemic in this situation. But if those of you that do feel comfortable, would love for you all to uh, put your videos on. And it's always great to look at people if uh, you don't mind. So Linda and I aren't the only sole people uh, looking at each other. And because I've got a few questions before I get started. So if you don't mind, those of you that are on, please, uh, share your screen and, uh, or not share your screen, share, share, show your beautiful faces to the world. So, uh, but with that said, I would love to ask some of you that are on this call and I would like some of you to actually get off mute. And I want to ask you a question. When you think about your family, who do you most resemble your mother or your father? And Let's add a second question. After you tell me who you resemble, do you know what day and what time you were born? I'll start. So thank you. I know what day and time I was born. I was born at 9 p.m. I won't share the the uh, <laughs> the year. You I don't was have to share the year. You don't have to share the year. You can share the day. Time I was born, 9 p.m. Um, I resemble my father in looks and I resemble my mother in personality. Thank you. I can go. Who next. else would like to share? I'll go. Um, I definitely resemble my mom in both looks and personality. Um, and then I was born July 4th, 1998. Um, I don't know the exact time. I know it was around like five in the morning. Cool. 98. I'm feeling really young right now, Linda. Thank you. No problem. Who, who else would like to uh, share? Let's get two more people, not people that are part of the whole uh, behind the scenes here. Some folks that are on the call. This is your time to shine. Got a shy audience. <laughs> we do. Is, is everyone shy? <laughs> I, can, I can go. 
I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know what time I was born. I think it was in the morning, um, but I was born. I also won't share the year to, to make everyone else <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, I was born in July. Um, I don't think I resemble either of my parents, oddly enough. Not that I'm adopted, but I just don't think I resemble either of them. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Claire. Who else? One more person. Me. So I don't know the time, and I'm, I'm not going to say the year, but I'm born in January. I think um, looks, I look like my grandmother, <clears throat> but I have my mom's stubbornness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Anna. Thank you. So I asked those questions because on a winter evening, a police officer was walking the streets and came across a waddled blanket with a baby. And it was the streets of Seoul, South Korea. And it was me, less than a year old, and took me to an orphanage where I stayed for six years. And there was no information, no note. It was basically why I asked that question. I actually did a TEDx talk about my adoptee story with a different angle, but today, will be different from my TEDx talk about that. And I actually started off with singing happy birthday. I won't um, bury your ears with that. But I bring that up and thought a different way to do this was most of you know who your parents are, know who you look like, know the date and exact time that you were born, and you can either double check with your parents because you have that information. There was no note when I was left on a street corner. So basically, I don't know my birth date. I don't know what year. Well, I do know the year. It was 1971. But I don't know the exact day or time. And I don't know who I look like, whether it's my mother or whether it's my father. And I bring that up because it really, I think, takes it straight to the profoundness of what an adoptee goes through, especially if they don't have that information. And one of the other factors that comes into play is, I always like to say, I know my team rolls their eyes because I say it way too often. I look young and cute, but I'm going to be turning 50 on April 2nd, which was the birthday that they gave me. So feel free to send all gifts to Linda and she'll ship them to my way. <laughs> but with that said, um, so my birthday was made up because when they sent me to the doctors, they estimated my birth in terms of what that would be. And, and then when I go to the doctors regularly, because as you get older, you need to do a regular checkup. And anytime I go to a new doctor, the number one question that they'll always ask you is, can you tell me if you have anyone in your family that have the following, you know, medical issues? And most of you have experienced that. I always say Shane Carlin sounds Irish with this beautiful Asian face, but that's the other disconnect that a lot of people have, which is, oh, this Irish name with this Asian face, and that always puts uh, some type of dissonance as people are thinking about that. And that's basically uh, why I say Shane Carlin sounds Irish, but I'm a Korean American adoptee. So I was born in Seoul, South Korea, I came over in 1976 to uh, Northern Kentucky near Cincinnati, Ohio on a farm. So next slide. And so um, basically what happened was, um, oh, sorry, next one. And um, as you see the, the streets of Seoul, I got on a Boeing 747 and flew from, uh, uh, and it was on Korean Airlines, that's why I'm not, I wish I was getting money from Korean Airlines as I posted their uh, company there and their airplane. But I flew from Seoul, South Korea to uh, Anchorage, Alaska, and then to Chicago, Illinois. And my parents picked me up from there, my adoptive parents, I should say. And I have a sister who is one year older than me, the biological uh, child of my adoptive parents. And I also um now have but this wasn't until i was in seventh grade i also have a brother too who is adopted from bogota colombia so we're like the united nations and and so basically i uh grew up in uh, northern kentucky on a farm 
and I was raised with cattle, uh, a 200 acre farm where I hardly had any neighbors. And um, the only Asian I saw was the person in, in the mirror because, and, and because I already told you my age of, of uh, born in 71, came over in 1976. For those of you that may or may uh, not be uh, tabulating the math here, but uh, or history, the internet wasn't around at that time, of course. So my parents really didn't know much about what was going on. And what was interesting is those people that know me really well, when they come out uh, to meals with me, they'll learn that I eat a lot of food and I don't mind eating it. And, and I'm really bad at buffets because I, I do want to invent like a double decker uh, plate where you can get like all the stuff you can. But I, I like to say on my own, I guess you could say counselor in the manner that I had cabbage soup morning, day and night. I was in a, a school room type concept where I, I slept there. I played there and I ate there with like 20 or 30 other kids. So when you think about a elementary or high school or junior high classroom, it was that type of situation of where I was in the orphanage. And I came over uh, malnourished and even my, uh, I, I don't even mind telling my story. This is that my parents had two dogs outside and if we had like fried food or whatever, my mother would get the, we'd get the dog food from downstairs, bring it up, put, you know, the dinner's uh, uh, grease from there and actually put it on the, uh, the dog food and then give it to the dogs because, of course, it made the dog food even more exciting. And um, I remember my parents telling me because I was so hungry, I even started eating the dog food because of the malnourishment that I had. And, you know, I think about this and I'm going to go a little tangent on this in the manner that when we think of the pandemic that's going on right now and so many people that are really hurting for food and people were hurting for food even before the pandemic, but it is exacerbated in such a huge way. So I highly encourage you to really think about the, the privileges you have, the access that you have and really encourage you to do whatever you can supporting the various nonprofits out there that are doing whatever they can to feed so many Americans that are hurting right now and not being able to get food. And so in my upbringing, I, you know, was basically, uh, I came over here at going on five, like six years old. And I was speaking, comprehending, and talking in Korean, but my parents only knew English and I did not know English and I didn't have a base language that comes from Hamnidad and thank you mean the same thing. And so it was really difficult to really learn the language and master that to the point where I actually went to Montessori school for two years before I went into first grade. So I was always one year older than everyone else. And, you know, the reason why I bring this up is because the whole essence of identity development that all of us go through is so crazy in itself. And even if you're a white male or white female, you're always going to have issues as you're growing up in general, just because kids can be mean, trying to fit in, trying to decide who's what, but then add the identity development that we have a different layer, add gender, then we have another layer, right? And when we talk about that, then add the adopting story. And it's so wild because as I was growing up, I did not, I did not want to look Asian. I totally defied my image, my look, because I was in a all white community. I lived on a farm. I went to elementary, middle school and high school where I pretty much was the only Asian. Now, we may have had a few Asian internationals here and there, but that, that's about it. So needless to say, and again, those of you that are around my age, if anyone remembers the, uh, they did a remake, but if anyone remembers the original Miami Vice, Don Johnson, people might know Don Johnson because he has a daughter by the name of Dakota Johnson that's out there that's done some, we'll just say, interesting films. And, and so Don Johnson had this like featherback hair. And it was blonde and it was, he was like the 
the, the goddess of all the women, like all the women wanted to be like Don Johnson. And just as I was growing up, I wanted to feather back my hair. I wanted, and of course, Asian hair is coarse and nothing like a blonde white dude's hair, right? And there were even times where I was like, oh, let me do my eyes. If I make them more round, would they? Would, would I be even more accepted like that? Um, my my um, arms don't have much hair. Uh, just and I and, and so many of my white friends always had so much hair on their arms and and I was like what's going on here why can I you know be uh, more uh, assimilated with the people that I'm around and it was a while for me to really find my identity and feel free that it was okay to be able to accept my Koreanness if you will or my Asianness so it wasn't until sixth grade when we went to Nashville, Tennessee, and that was when the World's Fair was down there. So if you've ever been to Knoxville, Tennessee, you'll see this big uh, ball, and that was from the World's Fair. It, it, it's a tower ball in Knoxville. And um, I remember my uh, sister and my mom, and we would go to the Korean exhibit, and I was all excited, and, you know, uh, do the whole Korean flag, do the kimchi, eating the Korean food, and was so excited. And then you get that experience and then you go back and you're like, oh, no, I'm not interested in that anymore. And so because every day, like anyone, like most of us, uh, we're made fun of. And um, uh, uh, being the only Asian, of course, I always got, you know, kids using the eyes, going Chinese, Japanese, all those other things. Give me those epithets all the time. And then, of course, uh, I'm kind of a smart ass and I've even had a wonderful smart ass father that I learned from his tactics too. And some people would say, are you Chinese or Japanese? And I would say, I'm or, and they'd be like, right. So are you Chinese or Japanese? I said, no, I'm or. So I would totally not explain what I meant from that. Just let him go because I would, it, it's, it's the old adage. Like most of us, when people go, where are you from? No, where are you really from? No, where are you really, really from? And it's kind of like, what mood am I going to be in today? Am I going to be in educational mood? Am I going to be in, in smart ass mood? Am I going to be in I'm pissed off mood? How am I going to react? Because we can only get those questions so many times in terms of the scenario or the situation and what I'm in. So the whole time I'm trying to be doing everything white male and assimilated because everyone in my family is white. Everyone I'm around is white. So I don't understand anything but that other than I'm only reminded of my Asianness when people remind me about that. When people say you're different or when they say that you don't look like me or or different things like that. And then even today, uh, at the time, I was thinking, oh, my God, it feels so good when they say, oh, Shane, I don't see you as Asian. You're like us. And of course, that was a huge compliment. But now today, as we really stop and think about it, it was one of the biggest insults, right? Because they are saying, you can be my friend. You can be uh, connected with me because I am assimilated with them. And that's what it's all about. When in essence, I wasn't really understanding who I was and what I'm about. So now fast forward to my junior year in uh, high school. And um, there was a time when i was asked uh shane do you want to go to this korean camp in michigan and i said no i'm not gonna go and they're like no it's gonna cost a lot of money either yes or no and finally i was like fine sure i'll go so i go to this korean camp and was so freaked out i didn't even know what this Korean camp was all about. I didn't even know why I was going to this at the time because I was so assimilated to the white way of doing things that I didn't really want to know who I was and what I'm about and what it means to be uh, Asian American, much less even Korean American. And I get off the bus because I flew into Detroit and then went onto this bus to so many hours to the actual camp. And it was a Korean adoptee camp that I finally figured out after while I was there. And everyone there was adopted like me and all the counselors are Korean American students from Michigan, University of Michigan, Michigan State, and, you know, other places. And it was the most freakish thing I've ever experienced in my life. 
is that I'm sitting there and, I, and I'm looking all over and say, holy shit, there are so many people that look like me. What? This is so freaking weird for me. And so many adoptees that uh, are, grew up or that are continuing to grow up. But now it's easier today because they have the internet to be able to find communities and, and videos and people that look like them. But at that time, we didn't have the internet. At that time, we didn't have uh, uh, air. I wasn't living in California or New York where there was a large sum of people that looked like me. And I just fell in love. I, you know, took the, of course, cooking class because food's so important to me. I, you know, learned how to write Korean. I, you know, just really enjoyed. And then I was like, oh, yay. I want to like go to Michigan or Michigan State because I got so excited. I came back to school. And then, oh, I think I said junior year. Um, I'm, see, when you get old, your memory gets bad. I think it was my eighth or ninth grade year. So it was around that time. So sorry about that. And, and so what happened was um, I was so excited. It was like, hmm, Korean power. I'm so excited. I'm all about Korea. And I, I, I do everything Korean. And then what happens is a week or two weeks later, no one else is like jiving with me about this. They didn't care. So I, I then resumed back to my white way of doing things because no one else was like following me with this. No one was, no one else was that interested in me, uh, interested in that. So it was not quote unquote sexy to do that. So I went back to doing my normal thing, being the, uh, looking Asian, but being the white male version of this Asian look and went from there. So then eventually, um, Fast forward to graduate school, where I did my, um, and, and quickly I did my undergrad at the University of Kentucky, uh, and then my master's at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, in higher education administration. And in that program, they teach you about yourself to nauseam, so that way you know yourself more than ever to be able to work with college students. And I was in residence life and housing, where you work with college students in the residence halls, or some of you might call it the dorms. And basically, I was in there in a class one time, and I was talking about my adoptee story, and someone said, Shane, when you're not with your adoptive parents, all people see is your Asian-ness. And it was just this eureka. It, it took me to that experience that made me stop in my tracks and was like, holy crap, you know, I need to now get to know who I am and what I'm about. And, and then that's really when the evolution started about me trying to get to know more about myself. And one of the things I did was I, actually during that time, my second year in grad school is I dated an African-American woman and dating her really gave me that experience to understand even a different culture in a deeper way that was something that I was missing out in terms of my own identity. And that experience also helped me out. And in turn, the Asian American Association at Miami University needed an advisor. And I started advising them and I said, look, let's make this a partnership. I will help you as a student affairs professional working with you guys and you help me to learn more about Asian American issues, Korean American culture, and different things like that. And that's how I started evolving in terms of, of doing that. Uh, next slide. I think I may have like screwed up on my slide, Charlene. Sorry about that. Oh, I guess I'm not too far off. So, so then basically my journey was uh, two years grad school, two years full time. And then I went to Northwestern University as a uh, area coordinator, ended up as a senior area coordinator for Resident Slide. But why I'm bringing these journeys up is then I went into uh, advising the API orgs at Northwestern University because I was so excited to be a part of that and started in including learning more. And then I started getting involved in a Korean American church. I, I joined the National Association for Asian American Professionals. I was like Asian everything, anything and everything I could do for Korean and Asian thing to just to like finally find myself and really like uh, uh, enjoy it. And then I, I uh, met this wonderful woman. 
who I moved to Columbus, Ohio, now my wife, going on 14 years this May. Um, and so I went to Columbus. Oh, thank you, Nancy. I went to Columbus and uh, was the director of Residence Life, and then I advised their, their API group, and I uh, started doing fundraising at NASPA, and at NASPA, which is the Professional Association for Student Affairs pra Practitioners, I joined the Asian Pacific Islander Knowledge Community in that group. Then uh, after that, I went to the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where for those of you that I'm sure know, has close to 43,000 students with 31% Asian, Asian American population. So I was definitely in heaven in terms of working with APIA groups because I had basically so many APIA groups to work with and help. Then I went back to Northwestern University uh, into uh, that, uh, continuing my fundraising. Next slide. And then um, I, uh, in 2015, I started up my own company. Uh, then uh, professionally, then uh, also continue my fundraising at the Amer American Red Cross and now the Salvation Army. But I'm going back to uh, Asian Student Achievement. And during my time from Miami University, really I started advising students in 1997 and working with college students, uh, API college students from 1997 till the present. And it has really just invigorated me because uh, throughout that journey, I've been able to read books from like Frank Liu, uh, Accidental Asian, or Helen Zia, uh, Asian American Dreams, and meeting these people. And, and Frank, uh, uh, or no, Frank Wu, I, I'm sorry, Eric Liu, who wrote Accidental Asian and Frank Wu, who wrote the book Yellow, and all these authors I got to meet and and really be even more uh, educated about the Asian American history because we all know in today's uh, even when I was growing up and I doubt I'd be shocked if if schools around the country are talking about the Chinese Inclusion Act or the Japanese internment camps or different things like that, or Vincent Chen case, those type of issues. And going through that experience and knowing the way Asian Americans are perceived in today's society of the quote model minority myth and experiencing and working with APIA students, that experience drove me to want to do something I've always wanted to do, which is own my own company and be an entrepreneur. And I remember one of my good connections said, Shane, if you're ever going to be an entrepreneur, make sure it's something you're very passionate about because you're going to have highs and lows in the organization and in the overall process of being an entrepreneur. And with that, I'm, uh, I will say this, I'm a stereotypical Asian uh, in terms of cheap. So I'm, or I should say frugal. And so I wanted to find, uh, I, I'm a risk taker, but not that big of a risk taker. And I wanted to find a, I, I wanted to do some type of a company where the, the uh, overhead was not going to be that much because I didn't want to actually uh, have to pay anyone. I wanted to raise my own money and I wanted to start up the company my own way and find different ways to be able to run the company with low overhead. And so uh, really, I started out with probably spending close to $1,200 when I started Asian Student Achievement. And I started this company because it's a for-profit company with a nonprofit mission to help move Asian and Asian Americans through the pipeline to leadership. And what made me think about starting this company was I was, as I've told you all, advising APIA groups all the time. I was having the opportunity to speak at the Midwest Asian American Students Union conferences, the National Association for Asian American Professionals conferences, being invited to colleges and universities and speaking on these type of things. And I was like, why don't I make it a business plan? But what really drove me to really do this is I remember being on a search, uh, uh, on a search for a director of a position, and I won't say the institution or the position because I'll give it away. But I said to this woman, um, can you tell me, a white woman, I said, can you tell me what will you do or what have you done to hire and retain diverse talent? 
And she said something that I'll never forget that made me candidly pissed off, but I didn't say it out loud. But I used that uh, anger to create this company. And she said, well, there just aren't any in the pipeline, which I said BS to that. I didn't say it to her, but I did say it in a way of saying, well, actually, there are many in the pipeline, but you're just not going to the right places to look for. And um, Asian Student Achievement is a three-pronged business plan, one-on-one coaching, uh, a diversity-driven job board. Charlene is going to type our uh, website in the chat. So while I'm talking to you all, feel free to go to our website, go to uh, learnasa.com and click on create a free career profile. And so I encourage you to sign up on the diversity driven job board. Um, And then the third aspect is I go to colleges, universities and conferences to speak on the soft skills because I want to make sure that Asian and Asian Americans are in the pipeline to leadership. I did not want this woman to ever use that excuse or any other person when they're asked the question, what are you doing? What are you doing to hire for diversity and retaining diverse talent? And that experience, and we've all seen this many of times, where people are not going out of their way when they have the power, when they have the privilege to do that. And every organization that I've been a part of, when I have the opportunity to hire, which I have at the Red Cross, at Northwestern, at Illinois, now at the Salvation Army, anytime I do that, I pretty much take my hand, go down, pull up, because I need to pull up other people too. And I pull up other people of underrepresentation not only of underrepresentation, but also gender, to make sure that we all know that women are not paid equally as men or that women don't get the opportunities as men. And I would also say for those of you that have the opportunity, if you haven't, those of you that are still in college, I encourage you to do this. Those of you that want to take an extra class on the side, one of the best courses I took in graduate school is gender studies course. At that time, they called it women's studies. And And it really helped me to be more conscientious about those issues. And I think it's so important that we, me as a male, need to understand even my own male privilege. Um, But also as an Asian American, I see the issues. But I also had the privilege of being raised white. And because I know that information and the way I look, I am always contested sometimes because people perceive me one way But then when I speak up, because quote unquote Asians don't speak up, then I sometimes get checked, which I did get checked by one of my supervisors one time and says, you're getting too aggressive. And I finally, you know, called her to the carpet and I said, look, you don't say the same things to my white male counterparts who do the same exact thing that I do. And I checked her on that. She got very defensive and mad because she's basically saying that I'm saying that she's racist. I said, I didn't say you're racist. I said, you need to be understanding of how that comment comes off because just because I'm Asian American and coming off the same way as my white male counterparts, why is it okay when they do it, but when I do it, it's considered aggressive. And so um, it's those type of situations of why I created this company to make sure that we do have a resource. And this company is for uh, college students. We're even excited to have, um, we're even excited to have uh, um, even our first ever high school student in our internship. And and we also work with uh, entry-level and mid-level professionals with the three-pronged business plan that we have. And so um, let me just go over that and then I'm gonna uh, pause and uh, Linda, you can let me know if there are any questions, but I'd be more than happy to leave the rest of the time for questions. And so I'm gonna bring that up. So think about some questions as I uh, go through the slides about who our company is and what we're about, if you don't mind. Uh, Next, Charlene. Oh, so here are the professional organizations I was a part of. Okay, well, I started ASA, I need to be better on my slides. Um, Go ahead. (laughs) So I already told you about who we are. Next slide. 
And so I also told you about the job board. So I encourage you to sign up on our diversity driven job board and please tell anyone and everyone, you know, and if you work at a company uh, and you want to make sure that they are being diversified, please encourage them to post on our site. We're like indeed and LinkedIn and all those others. But the difference is this is we have uh, 1,360 plus job seekers that 95% are diverse talent across the across the world, most of them from the United States. So it's really exciting. So if you want to sign up as a job seeker for free, do that. If you know that your company uh, wants to post jobs, please send them our way. We'd really love to have them post with us. Next. The other thing is this is we're partnering with Juno. All of us, uh, a lot of us have student loans. So if you have uh, a student loan and you would like to refinance, especially if they're private loans, you can do that right now. We know with the, the U.S. government right now uh, putting a pause on federal loans, but you can renegotiate your federal loans with Juno. But Juno is like Hotels.com where you can find the best rate hotel. This is a group where you can find the best rate non-predatory banks that you can renegotiate your loan. So it's kind of cool. So feel free to sign up on our site if you're interested in learning more about that. Next. And please invite us to speak to your company, your a AR, uh, uh, wait, wait, their, uh, what are they called? Uh, so, no, uh, what are the groups that are affinity groups? What are they called at companies today? Anyone? Like they have Asian American, African American, Latinx, LGBTQ uh, resource groups. ENGs or uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, employee resource groups. That's it. So if you want to invite us to those, or if you know of schools or conferences or whatever, we love talking about different topics. Um, and feel free to reach out to us about that. Next, and questions. So that is my. Uh, story in uh, I guess you could say in 40 minutes in terms of why I started as uh, why I became an entrepreneur needless to say we're not making millions of dollars or I would be doing this full-time uh, so I have my own full-time job but do this on the side but I really enjoy this I can't thank uh, Nancy and Linda again for inviting uh, me to be a part of an Asian student achievement to be a part of this and and being able to have this conversation but uh, I will uh, yield back to Linda if she sees any questions or comments that you'd like to read or if there are any questions about my uh, don't worry no question is um, too harsh feel free to ask because not many adoptees will talk about their journey and I'm more than happy to do that and also uh, if you want to learn anything about entrepreneurship and I don't know everything I just I'm, I'm winging it too yeah, so it looks like Courtney has a comment. Uh, yeah, Shane, I just wanted to um, actually compliment you on the work that you do. Uh, Thank you, Courtney. It's, it's really important, and uh, particularly what you said about uh, the gender, um, you know, the course that you mentioned. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, it, if, if America was as smart a country as it <laughs> always claims to be, then that would be something that was standardized, um, you know, for, Bring for, on. People, you know, for people to take it because it, at least it, it would instill, I'm sure, higher levels of empathy across, you know, all sides. And of course, that obviously that would make for better human relations um, across races and cultures and, and uh, humanity as a whole. So anyways, it's great work that you do and just wanted to compliment you on that. Thank you so much, Courtney. It means a lot. I appreciate it. No, absolutely. Linda, any other comments or anyone that wants to get off mute and ask any questions? Yeah, we can definitely open it up. Um, does anyone have any questions? I um, have one that uh, came in via text. <laughs> um, oh, wow. So just, um, you know, being Asian American, I think um, entrepreneurship and being an entrepreneur is not always encouraged by our family members. Um, and, you know, I, I just, um, could you speak a little bit about um, like just words of encouragement for the entrepreneurial Asian American community 
um, and, you know, words to help them keep fighting the good fight. <laughs> no, I think that's a good point. And one of the things that makes it a little harder for me to answer that is because uh, the person that's probably asking that question, I'm just going to make an assumption, is they probably have Asian parents. And, and with that, there's always, sadly, in the Asian American community, you're pushed to be a lawyer, be a doctor, be, you know, all these high profile type uh, um, professions. And, and sometimes uh, Asian American parents, uh, they're getting better. But I know, as I was, uh, you know, going through the journey of working with APIA students, because I had white parents. So I was I didn't have that same type of pressures that so many Asian American kids do with their their parents or their grandparents. And and so um, I, I think that one thing to do is to be able to if you are worried, because most of us do love our parents and most of us want to impress them and not disappoint. And it is it can be a hard dialogue to have with the parents. But then ultimately, what I always tell people, especially as I was advising college students that were saying they wanted to be uh, they didn't want to be a doctor. And I remember coaching one and um, now he's in New York City. He finally came out and he's gay, married with a child and is on Broadway. But his parents pushed him to be a doctor. And and so. Um, it's really having those conversations and really go with your passion. And the statement that I tell students every time is it's you that have to wake up every morning when the alarm clock goes off, not your parents. And it's you that has to go to work every day, not your parents. So you have to find what you're passionate about and what you love and what you want to do. And yes, will it have some uh stern moments and some tough moments in the relationship but it's it, it's really a journey and talking it out but if you go with what you love and what you're passionate about then go for that but needless to say i'm an example of where i'm a i'm a small risk taker because i i will not risk basically going full throttle with asian student achievement without still having an income in my full-time job so it does take some time and that's what you got to do is look at your finances look at your you know who or if you're okay with you know taking out uh loans or getting um um you know uh investors that are going to invest in you and and but you gotta you know always give back that's the problem uh to keep in mind and and what your outlook's going to be so i would say those are just some of the comments in terms of responding to that question. Hopefully that helped that person that uh, sent that text. Thanks for sharing that. I have another question. Um, so, I mean, how do you feel about the Asian American culture of getting a safe job, um, but it's also held back entrepreneurship in the community and ultimately the growth of Asian businesses and the focus on the Asian consumer? You know, uh, I'll tell you, I I went in, um, w w let me even go back up a little bit. I'll give an example to try to hopefully answer that. And one of the things that I came in all arrogant and cocky about my company was, oh my God, I'm going to get people left and right to buy, you know, coaching because uh, especially, you know, when you think about disposable income. Uh, when you think about uh, where Asian Americans fit on that, um, we're pretty high, right? And and when you think about how especially parents, Asian American parents, will spend money for their kids to get the best of the best of whatever that they can for those parents that do have uh, the financial means. And even then, they'll, you know, go, you know, uh, high and low to try to find the dollars to be able to, to help their kids. And I thought I would be getting one-on-one -on -one coaching left and right uh, because of that. I got nothing <laughs> and no one would pay for that. And so it was very shocking uh, to have that rude awakening. So I, I think it's, you know, trying to, I thought I have, I would have a market on that, but it's really testing out what the market is, what the need is, because when you think about entrepreneurship in the Asian American community, 
the stereotypes are really, uh, you know, the the laundry uh, facilities, right, or or restaurants, or or different things like that. But you don't see companies like mine or what Nancy does, or or others that are out there. And you're starting to. I mean, of course, you see the big ones out there, like um, what's the not Grubhub, but DoorDash. Is it DoorDash that's got the Asian American CEO there? And I don't even know if he started it up. And even even the uh, Asian American presidential candidate, I can't think of his name, um, who who uh, I think he was an entrepreneur and made his money big from that. Oh, he's and from mayor of New York, I can't think of his name. Right, exactly. right. I can see his face, but I can't think yeah. of his name. Um, I'm sure someone in the group knows it. But but so I think we've got to be looking at that. And then the other thing is I was telling my business development interns uh, in a meeting one time, I sent an email or sent a message. Someone from University of Chicago, and that's as far as I'll go, um, sent a post on his LinkedIn and, and said, uh, we've got a position. Oh, yeah, Yang, thank you. Um, and 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 so um, and said uh, uh, they had an open position, and I I said, oh, that's great. Would you mind posting on our diversity-driven job board? It's one ninety-nine for thirty days. Click on that button. Blah blah blah. He responded back and said, uh, oh, we already post on diversity sites. And what I did in return, Linda, for I think that was your question or whoever or if you were asking for someone else. But what I did in return in that response is I said, oh, thanks for letting me know. But if I'm a betting man, you probably uh, are not posting on Asian American job board sites. If you are, that's terrific. But if you aren't, I doubt it. That's a little ballsy, candidly. In fact, the two interns that were with me kind of like their eyes went like that because like, oh my God, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe I did that either. But sometimes you got to do that a little bit. Um, a day or two later, he responds and says, we'll post with you, <laughs> you know? And so why I bring that point up is, is that I, you've got to sometimes, we have to like debunk the model minority myth and we've got to put ourselves out there and we got to push ourselves because candidly, um, the Latinx, African American, and Caucasian communities will continue to do that. But we as Asian Americans don't do that enough. And we as Asian Americans aren't as bold enough. And 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 uh, we're starting to get better at that, but we've got to push on that. So I hope I answered your question, Linda. But if there's more specifics that I could add to that, just let me know. No, that was great. Thank you. Um, hi, Shane. It's Freddie Baez. Uh, Hi, Freddie. Uh, nice to meet you virtually. You too. Uh, I, I just and, and I, I did a you know obviously and Nancy kind of uh, really shared a lot of what you do over several months. Uh, uh, and uh, I really just want to stress how important this is. I'm I'm a product of organizations like this on the Latino side. I'm Puerto Rican, right? But That's awesome. uh, if it weren't for LULAC. Uh, which is a Latin organization specifically working for uh, looking, uh, working with high school c uh, uh, students in, in um, I would say, underserved communities, right? I, I grew up in what people would term as a hood community, <laughs> right? But uh, this organization, like, they handheld me through mm -hmm. all the college application process, all the That's scholarship awesome. processes. I was lost. Uh, I didn't know how to really approach financial aid. I approached people at my own school. My high school counselor really didn't have any uh, uh, time or, or, or really didn't do what kind you need to do with students, kind of guide them to the college process. Then at UIC, I ended up at UIC, and I was a, a, a product of Latin American Recruitment and Educational Services, which is more in your lane, right? College students kind of uh, helping them through school, but then also trying to bridge them to the professional world. Um, and again, I don't know what I would have done if it weren't for those type of organizations, right? And it, it is a skill set to kind of calibrate uh, college students for the reality beyond that fourth year. You know, everybody's just focused on graduation. And a lot of people say, I'm going to take time off. 
right? When I graduate, I'm going to take time off. And all those guys who took time off were the guys that were like really at, you know, had a lot of problems getting employed, right? They didn't have a plan. And I think this organization and, and organizations like this could really be, uh, you know, help bridge that, you know, and really get people thinking forward. And I just think it's so, so important. And some of the things you address today, and it's always, you know, always interesting to hear some of the challenges that, uh, you know, my Asian colleagues and Asian friends kind of go through because yes, you know, uh, there is conversations in other communities are like, they're the model minorities. I hate using the word minority, but like, yeah. you know, they're the model this and, you know, they're the example of that. And then there's just so it, there's just so much more uh, to that story that like, unfortunately, doesn't get heard because people buy into these stereotypes. They buy in and they're glad to keep you in that box. Right. Yes. And, yes. and it's really like even being friends with Nancy and, and I, we actually really uh, relate to um, this whole thing with our families, even though yeah. you know, I'm Latino, she's Asian, but like the value of our parents, the value of respect and how that also needs to be incorporated in everything. Like, you know, we got to take on the world. We got to be professionals, but we also got to maintain this culture and, all that, and there's a lot of pressure for us to carry things on and move things forward. And I was like, oh, that really resonated of like how we're similar in a sense, right? And I, I, I didn't, if I didn't take the time to really understand her as a person, would have not have been uh, fortunate to be shared some of these things that happened for her, her as as a Taiwanese uh, a person, right? So. Uh, she's smiling because she probably is like, I butchered Taiwanese. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I, I appreciate your share because your story is amazing. Your background you. is amazing. And, and like, you know, this whole, you know, I, I think with the name and I, you know, I was, it's just, it's, it's a really good story. And I, I applaud uh, you sharing that story. And, you know, I, f I hope that it resonates with a lot of people on this call because I think it's important to tell these stories. And I think it's important to also provide this bridge you're providing. So kudos to you. I just wanted to share with, it was definitely, uh, you know, uh, really enlightening, further enlightening for me. And I'm always appreciating to hear other people's journeys, like uh, the one you shared today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So it looks like there's a question from Martina. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and read the whole comment. Um, so she said, like you, I experienced getting made fun of while growing up as an Asian American. Do you think Asian Americans, Asian American kids today face less discrimination than when you were growing up in America, um, you know, due to the acceptance of K-pop and Korean cinema being rec recognized more in America? Um, and then also, what other challenges do you think Asian American kids face today? Um, do your kids tell you? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I would say the difference is this is um, we're getting made fun of. I would say kids are making getting made fun of about the same, if not more. And one of the reasons, sadly, is the most recent uh, uh, person that was in the White House. I don't even want to say his name or his position. And when you're, you know, when he was saying nationally, internationally, Kung flu or China flu, you know, that exacerbated it even more. Uh, like, for example, I remember some of you may remember that uh, that when uh, uh, that that uh, Korean student uh, shot up so many people at Virginia Tech uh, was the most horrific experience. And every person of underrepresentation is like, when you hear about a shooting, please, please, please don't let it be. The population that you kind of look like right and and when it is and, and everyone latinx african-american asian american are like oh damn it it's it's one of us you know and i remember going to uh i was living in columbus ohio i remember going to the grocery store uh one weekend uh after that shooting and for the first time ever i felt a little bit like an African-American being looked at and being watched. 
because I felt like that uh, anyone that looked like that guy who shot up all those people, anyone that was Asian male, um, probably had someone clutch their purse or someone look over and was scared whether that person was going to pull out a gun or different things like that. And you finally got a sense of how uh, sadly, you know, Arab Americans go through regularly. Um, I remember being here during uh, 9-11 in uh, at working at Northwestern University. And we all know Devon Street, you know, is all Indian, uh, mostly Indian, I should say, not all. And and so many, I remember the restaurants had like, if they could put 20 American flags on their, you know, on their uh, uh, windows, they would because they wanted to reiterate to people, you know, don't attack us. We're not, you know, this population that everyone is stereotyping us on, you know. So I, I sadly think that kids today that are Asian American are still getting the same, if not more. The difference that they have today that I did not have is they have the Internet to go to resources. They do have more outlets uh, to be able to bond and, and create groups and, and find those safe places to journey. Um, and then the second part of that question, Linda? Yeah, so it said, what other challenges do you think um, Asian American kids face today or you know, that your kids would tell you? I, I think I think the challenges now is candidly mixed in with almost everyone's challenges with social media, right? Uh, just add the social media aspect that just takes it to a, another level. Uh, easy ease ofness of bulliness, ease ofness of trying to be like someone. Um, even though it's exciting that there's K-pop out there, that there was you know fresh off the boat that was on ABC for a while, uh, Doctor. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Ken show, um, you know, even the, the, uh, that wedding movie, I'm forgetting what that one was called that, that came out, um, you know, and, and seeing films out there, I, you know, uh, when I grew up, I didn't have any of that. Now the only closest thing was the, uh, Margaret Cho sitcom that was out when I was in college, but that only lasted, I think like one month. It may have been a little longer, but it only felt like one month. And and so so there's at least more resources out there for this population. But sadly, I don't think it's it's gone down. I think it's more. And and I think that there's uh, there's a different type of um, discrimination, especially at the at the institutions that have predominantly more Asian Americans or industries that have more Asian Americans. So it's a uh, well, we have enough of you all, so we don't need to hire you. So I think there's that part of it that's going on. Thanks for answering that. My pleasure. Thank you for asking. Did you have anything else to that? No, I was going to say it's, um, I don't know, as, as you were uh, saying your answers, um, it just made me think of like, you know, obviously people can use social media as a tool um, to build communities and to have a voice, um, to talk about, you know, things, you know, especially with like mental um, illness or things that you're, you know, is on your mind that you quite can't say it to certain people. Maybe, you know, when, you, when you're on the internet, you're able to form like your own group of people that, that you can relate to. But then on the contrary side, it's like you can also, you know, there, it's cyber bullying is a thing. So it's kind of like knowing, and, and I mean, obviously like, I can't imagine like being a teenager in this day and age, like knowing where the line is and using social media where it's not going to be, you know, you, you don't dedicate every single minute of the day to, to think like anyone, anyone says is the truth on there, but then also like using it in the positive aspect, which is creating healthy um, conversations with other people that look like them or that have similar, you know, stories. Um, I think it's, it's a obviously a very powerful tool, but then it's also like, it's really dangerous as well. So I was kind of been fascinated with that aspect of social. Well, thanks for your insight and thanks for your question. Um, Charlene, if you don't mind putting our uh, ASA email account uh, address on the chat. So if people do have further questions or comments, uh, feel free to do that or go to our website.
website and feel free to go to the contact page if you want to contact us through that mechanism too but i know linda you said we have to end at seven so i'll yield to you in terms of what's next yeah um so i guess we'll wrap up here thank you so much uh for taking the time to do this discussion um amazing story um yeah it was great thank you well, thank you again thank to you, you and nancy i appreciate it no problem thank you thank you so thank much. you Shay. thank have you appreciate it have a good night good night thank, thank you, you.